Hello. Hi. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello, you? <laughs> you can't hear anybody, can you? Surprise! <laughs> Common problem. Is that need to dissolve again? Probably. You could hear them, I couldn't hear them. As Sorry you... <laughs> about that. <laughs> Hi everyone, how are you doing? Happy su Sunday. Um, oh, classic. Sunday? Yeah. Why am I here? It is Sunday. Um, Why am I here? <laughs> I, I don't know. Daylight Savings Day. Congratulations. It's actually I, Saturday. I think we were all forced by Ange to just appear at the last minute. So. Why are we collectively here? <laughs> that almost never happens. <laughs> um, yeah, how are you all doing? Have you all had a lovely weekend? Fantastic. Good here. Good. Good, good. good. Um, unfortunately, chat, you've just missed the best conversation of the night because we were just having a big Stargate conversation um about the upcoming stargate ttpg that one day will emerge itself and we will one play day. it um <laughs> it will arrive before christmas we just don't know which year <laughs> yeah <laughs> may, it, it may arrive before the apocalypse <laughs> no that'd be good if it did <laughs> um but yeah so yeah so we're here tonight we're doing the q a we have the amazing john hicks as, a, as our guest. Uh, we have Kadari, he's always here. He's the one with the questions. Uh, we have Lloyd Go Boom, you all know Lloyd. Um, yeah, enough said. And then we have Strain down there. Uh, Strain, who does our carbon games. If you've not watched that, go check them out on the YouTube. They're really good. Um, yeah. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. That's what you're supposed to say. Yes, see, th this is why we need an Ange here. Um, do subscribe, subscribe to the YouTube you. channel um, and do join us on our Discord if you are into this sort of thing. We're doing a QA and a tonight um, and we are specifically doing a QA and a on being a new DM slash GM. Um, tips and tricks, notes to, to do. Who knows? Kadari's going to give us the questions. And we're just going to ramble on like a bunch of old men who clearly needed a drink because it's Sunday and we've all got work in the morning and couldn't have that drink. I, um, haven't. I haven't got work in the morning. All right. I think I might go and get a drink. <laughs> well, <laughs> shit. Some of us. This day just got worse. Gonna, gonna, some of us are having a better day than others. Um, yeah. Been... <laughs> oh, I wish I could do that. Um, but yes. <laughs> So we're here. Um, yeah. If you have any questions during the Q&A session that are related or unrelated, do use your channel points to send us the question. We'll pin it up. If it's related, um, we'll sneak it into tonight's show. If it's not related or we just don't get round to it because we are only here for an hour and a half, we will be leaving at half ten one way or another. Um <laughs> no, we will be leaving. Um, yeah, if you've got Depends any questions, how much did I drink? <laughs> we'll save the questions. Don't worry. If you spend your channel points to so give us a question, we don't use it. It will go into our bank that Kadari looks after, and it will go to a new Q and A session. Um, and as always, if you have any Q and A's that you questions that you'd like us to answer, jump up in our Discord and let them know, and we'll line them up when we can. But tonight's Q and A, we've got enough questions to give us a topic of new dm and gm so kadari would you like to start the proceedings yes we'll start with the most important bit what advice would you give to a new dm it's always a thing that ends up last on the list so this is the first <laughs> thing we're doing don't do it i mean no, no. seriously do it. <laughs> do it do it do it we need more turn around yeah. and walk away <laughs> put down the books and step back I can see we're all on the same page. <laughs> Don't do it. You'll lose your life. Keep it simple. Yeah. If 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 you, yeah, if you... To keep it simple. Yeah. No. We... Yeah. Don't let Andrew twist your arm. No. Yeah. Um, but, you know, social distancing. Things. If you keep it simple, you're going to take pressure off because you're going to have a lot of pressure yeah. on you to get the game right, especially if you're DMing, GMing for seasoned players or people who have experience. If you keep it simple. And keep everything light and no not many encounters not many npcs keep this even keep the story simple you walk into a room and shoot something in the face keep it as simple as possible yeah. 
because then one you'll get over your, your your own nerves of actually winning a game for people and two you don't have to concentrate on a thousand things at once if you if you if you're gming a, a complicated game uh, with lots of rules and tables you're gonna have enough on your plate already so uh so yeah keep it simple i always suggest using either a cut down version of your system that you usually play or use a simple simple system because then your mind's not going to be filled with charts tables rules regulations and outcomes you're just going to be focusing on the game and that's really the priority yeah. yeah and if you are playing even if it's like a new rpg or just something like if you decide like, oh i'll play D, &D even though it is a bit tr like clunky at times so you just pick a part of it that you want to explore yeah and there's and no then just do that for a bit yeah. until you've got the handle on it then add an extra thing mm. like there's games that have like oh here's like the whole on foot section here's the whole spaceship or airplane section like mm. you don't need to do them all in the same adventure unless you're a lunatic um no <laughs> um i i would say one of the most important bits to making the decision as well is is it what you want to do i think there's too many people who get pushed into it because you know there's a group of mates and no one wants to do it they feel like you know one of them goes oh go on yeah. you do it you you don't do it because you're pressured into it or because you're the only one who's willing do it if you want to do it because i think it's the hardest thing you know it's hard for players to come around the table on a regular basis but i think it's really hard for the for the dm or gm because if you don't yeah. show the game doesn't happen and so mm. you, it's a it's a lot of commitment and so if you're not in it because you want to be in it i think you'll burn yourself out very quickly i think you play a lot yeah. first as well play as much as you possibly mm. can don't make dming or gming your first action in role playing play a lot see how others do it watch a lot of online streams watch this channel watch some of the games here watch how other people do it how it works out how players interact all that sort of stuff to learn as much as you possibly can about the game yeah. and about how games are run before mm. you sit down at the DM's table. So it's all clear in your head. Um, but I also think having the genre fit you as well. I mean, uh, if, if you know, if you don't like that sort of genre, you're, I think your players will pick up on it more. You know, it, it's got to be something that you want to run more than it, more importantly as well. The, the actual game has to fit what you're you're good at. And you, you don't really have to be a great storyteller to be a good DM and GM because there's so many pre-made stuff, stories out there. There's campaigns and that that are rope for people. You can follow them, and you don't have to make anything up. You can literally be a, a decent DM and GM just from that. But if you're not into that sort of that category of style, whether it be sci-fi, horror, or you know medieval sort of D and D style sort of stuff. You're not going to get the most out of it yourself if you're not into that genre. And again, the, the problem is when you're running these games, is how you feel gets passed on to the players. If you're enjoying it, they'll enjoy it. If you're not enjoying it, they will not be enjoying it. I think that I've, I've seen a couple of games that go awkward because of that, where you know the, your games master doesn't quite enjoy running it, sort of thing. Mm. If you forget Another how much minute. time has passed, Sorry, yeah. If you forget how much time has passed when you're GMing, DMing, and and suddenly the players will be not wanting to end. Simple, straightforward. Just go for it and have fun. Be passionate about it. Mm. Yeah. It's also a segue for the bit where about like, oh, you don't have to be a masterful storyteller. Is the thing is you're only the players. You can also do some of that lifting as well because they also have an imagination. I hope. Um, so you don't need to be like, oh, here's all masterful, like David Eddings esque descriptions of everything. Just be like, you can just tell them that and they can imagine it themselves. Mm. They don't need like every single keyword. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing, actually. Don't think that you, as the DM or GM, is the one that's carrying the entire game. Yeah. Because it's all there for the same reason. And uh, their involvement and how they get into it also takes a bit of pressure off your shoulders as well. Yeah. So I know that can be kind of the thing that happens with. Like these online stream things, like Critical Role, like they're really good at getting people interested in D and D. Mm. But then I've seen a lot of new D and D, like new DMs are like, what they're like, this, is this what I'm supposed to do on a daily basis? Yeah. And like I don't think I'd ever manage it, so they don't do it. And you're just like, no, this is, this is like a show, not a not like a regular game. Yeah. yeah. I think there's definitely a an element that if you're just watching very popular streams like yeah. Critical Role or Acquisitions Incorporated that you can feel like you need to put in the same level of effort that they are. 
unrealistic yeah. expectations. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, just on that point alone, the whole, you know, it's not all up to you, I do agree strongly with that. I think um, a good example of this is from Kadari's game that he runs on a Sunday. We, um, we do this thing where when you send us traveling, um, you make us describe what we go. Oh, you give you get us to give you the inspiration of what we see on our travels, <clears throat> and I have to admit it's been quite interesting. <laughs> what the endless bar? <laughs> yeah, mountains of gold. But the, <laughs> Someone it, did try yeah. to put an endless bar in there. It was yes. entertaining. <laughs> it was entertaining. Yes, it was. It was brilliant, especially <laughs> when you twisted it that we had walked into a load of shrooms and were hallucinating. <laughs> it was brilliant. <laughs> but yeah, it, I think it was really good. And I, I, it's, I have to admit, it's one of the features I do enjoy specifically that I've seen brought in where you as a player get to actually decide something of the world and that. And it, it's very minimal, but I think it's enough and it's a good little bit of creativity there. Yeah, it's a lot of what, uh, what John was saying as well, that the players are as much responsible for Krampus' narrative as the GM is. And a lot of the time you feel that you should do everything as a D as a GM. You should be describing mm. the location they're in and the location they're going to and how they get there, etc. Just shift that onto the players. If you need five random encounters between here and there, make the players describe three of them. Yeah. Or if you, if there is a, like a combat situation, if if I feel what the characters are, what the players are doing is going to impact. Uh, the description, like you say, I get them to describe it. Like, if they're going to shoot somebody, if they get the killing blow in, my question is, okay, what is it you do? What does it look like? Yeah. What do you hit? Where do you hit him? How does this happen? And you let, get them a, a little bit more sort of involved in, in the narrative, so to speak. Or get them to use their imaginations. I mean, like you were saying uh, earlier, um, you, say, you, you, you can literally just describe, okay, you're walking down a forest path and there's a mountain in the distance, and that's all you need to say. Their, their imaginations will do the rest. You could yeah. go into minute Tolkien detail about each blade of grass and how old the bark is on that tree and why that squirrel's got split up from his wife, but nobody cares about that. They care about the path, the forest, and the mountain. And as soon as you can put that image in their head, that's all the work you need to do. So don't overblow it. And I'd always yeah. be careful. Also, the other... The other... Sorry, Karen? I'd, say I'd always be careful as well about you can give too much information and sometimes yeah. you can describe something that you you were just thinking i'm describing the room and yet you could throw your players off because you mentioned a red door and all of a sudden they're like why is there a red door well there has to be something about this yeah. red door and you know d simplicity is sometimes the best because you've got to let the players have their imagination you know, yeah, but sometimes yeah. that as well that sends the players off in the wrong direction because i remember mm. playing warhammer once and there was a goblin in a bar and their question was, what was the goblin's name? I said, I don't know, Snot. And then they spent the rest of the game talking to Snot. And then Snot went <laughs> off them on adventures. And they were, all they were doing was being concerned about Snot. Because I mentioned a goblin at the end of the bar. So, yeah, getting too much detail yeah. is, is a bit of a trap. Because they once had a three-game adventure because Snot got captured <laughs> during a big battle. And that's it now. I thought, that's it now. Snot's gone. It's out of the picture. Let's just crack on with the adventure. And then I had to do three yeah. sessions and go to rescue Snot. <laughs> Like, for God's sake. I, mean, I think a self propagating adventure is kind of a win. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but like, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, there's that kind of trick of trying to they, this, like describe everything with the same amount of detail if you don't want anything to look like a like it's important. Yeah. You can think of like, oh, those squirrels over there, they've set up from there. They're, they're, they're having like a relationship breakdown and be like, ah, oh, in that case, they're narratively important because they've yeah. had more detail than the forest path and the mountain in the background. <laughs> I was just speak to the squirrels. Ange would like to know if Snot survived. Sorry? If Snot survived. Him. Did An Ange would it, like to know if he did. rescued him and survived. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, poor little Tyke. He got taken by bandits and then was going to be sold into slavery in the Chaos Wastes. I have but the to be there. I, yeah. I genuinely would believe that that's something that Ange would do. She by the end of the session, I was going to die. It's not going to die. They're never playing with me ever again. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not lived, it's not, it's not alright. Yeah. Yeah. Well, funny enough, that, that is actually happening in the Mutants of Asimov's campaign I'm doing. And in, is it you, Lloyd, as well, that are campaigning about... Or is it Mark? Two of you are campaigning about a mutant that was supposed to be a side character, and you're like, we have to go back and save him. It's like... Oh, yeah, Mark, Danny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Danny. I mean, I was the bad guy. I'm the guy who's going to kill him. Like, I don't know yeah. what everyone else is doing anymore. We need to go back and rescue Danny. It's like, <laughs> he was a null character. Now, I, don't make me yeah. write him into this. 
<laughs> yeah. That's sometimes sometimes that can spark creativity in a DM. Oh, God, yeah. They will notice this thing, or they'll notice that character or that item or something that you described. And then because they focus on that a little bit, that then forces you either to be creative at the seat of your pants and mm. say, I don't know, in that case then the his name's Snot and he's from this clan Bigfoot or whatever I called it, I don't remember. So yeah, and it's supposed to be creative. Or after the session, it's like, well, they're focused on that. Let's do something with it. Then you sit down and start making notes. And that kind of forces a yeah. little bit of creativity. And that's what's exciting because I'm a forever DM. And that's what's exciting about being a forever DM is the fact that you have these moments of spontaneous creativity, uh, which take you off down a completely a road that you, weren't, that, that you weren't expecting or prepared for. And that's, that's actually quite exciting as a creative. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I think that's one of the important things. Uh, probably another bit of advice there for GM and is don't worry about the story getting tangented because it will happen. You know, mm -hmm. players ha will either go down the wrong route because they misread your notes or they get in character. And they, I think this is the best bit is where they get in character and their character gives a reason to do something that you didn't plan um i'm pretty sure croy did not plan for us to stay on the farm on, on the current D, D campaign that we're doing but <laughs> it was like my character was so adamant like i'm not leaving these people i i want to stand and defend this farm and it, it, it was an interesting moment because it did kind of show all the party members what their thoughts were on this moral situation um which I think is brilliant for character development and for party development because you all start to twig to each other like, all right, so you don't care about this sort of thing, and you know, so yeah, well, yeah, and it was good. I mean, honestly, it was a it was an interesting tangent, and it was a great battle sequence that I enjoyed. <laughs> My character spent most of it running through fields of wheat. Yeah, I missed it. I missed a <laughs> trick there. I have to have something to remember for the next time we have a the shortest um, argument. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah so yeah i'd say you know a big big tip for a, a new gm is don't over plan it because they your plans probably won't work out have, yeah. have an idea of what you want to do as your story and everything but don't expect it to go according to plan and be flexible allow your players to do it. i think i think we discussed this on a previous q a where we were talking about railroading is you know you, you've really got to let your players go off the tracks a little bit but you know create situations they create stories yeah 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 just people... make sure you as the gm take notes at the end of the session while it's fresh in your mind yeah of what the players <laughs> yeah, yeah. have done <laughs> that be way... an awkward position of having yeah. to ask the or, players or if you're lazy <laughs> record everything yeah, yeah. <laughs> stream it and then you don't have to worry about notes you can just go back and watch it yourself <laughs> now I've had occasions where I'll be six months down the line and a player will ask me about an NPC that they'd previously encountered in a town that I hadn't considered important but the players for some reason had considered important and it wasn't clear to me at the time yeah. and they're just like well last time we were here there was a different bartender and we are interested in that bartender and I'm like right I have no idea <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm uh, sorry, but you've just ruined my suspension of disbelief. <laughs> <laughs> this person doesn't exist anymore. What is it, the Matrix? What's going on? What game are we playing? Yeah. Um, I think the last bit of advice I'd like to give to anyone who is thinking about GMing, and, uh, I, I would strongly say, yes, learn the system that you're going to use. It is important that you know the system to some degree, but don't get bogged down in the rules. If, if you forget something, if you do something wrong, don't worry about it. He, honestly, it will happen. There'll be moments in game, and if you're sat there reading the book trying to remember that rule for that mechanic, it, it, it honestly, you just it, it can kill the game, and your players will forget things as well. You don't, you'll never know whether it was intentional or not, whether or not they forgot that they were severely crippled and they went through a battle and they should have been rolling disadvantage on everything and they didn't because they forgot. You know, you, you don't know. It's like they... an oddly specific situation. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, that sounded very specific to me. Yeah. Yeah. I'll admit, there's a couple of times yeah, where I've done that. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, there's the, especially with a game like Dungeons & Dragons, is I think even people who've been playing it for years will still forget simple mechanics. And there's a reliance to some degree on your players knowing their specific rules set for their character and giving you that information sometimes as the gm 
you can't be expected to learn every single rule off the back mm. of your head. I think even if you've done it for like 30, 40 years, you'll probably still find that there's a few rules that you, you've missed or, you, you know, you interpret differently, which is the common thing. You know, rules are written in one language and some people will take it one way and some people will say, oh, no, this doesn't apply to this because it, it says items, yeah. doesn't say item. <laughs> I think, yeah, it, it, yeah. don't worry about it just play the just, game just and enjoy it, it. Quick ruling, get it out of the way and then move on and if it is an issue then address it at the end of the game yes don't do it during the game because that'll just stall the game and that could yeah. turn into all kinds of different discussions and then you forget where you mm. are so yeah like you say don't worry about the rule just make a very quick ruling make a quick note and you'll come back to that at the end of the game and then if it's important then yeah and just address that and then make sure it doesn't happen again. And if it's not important, then just don't worry about it and just crack on and just have fun. Yeah. And if there's a rule you don't like, discuss it with your players and get rid of it. I, th yeah, I think that that's one of the best things to do in the system is if you don't like a certain part of it and you don't want it or you can't be arsed with it. I think like the most common thing, people tend to disregard weight in these campaigns and they you know they don't want to be sat there working out the weight of all the coins and all the items that they've collected to tell you whether they're encumbered or not i think that's one of the first things that always goes in a lot of campaigns where people just go sod yeah. it eating and drinking it's like sod that we're not <laughs> we're not wasting our time doing that it, you do what suits your your people if you want to do a hardcore full-on rp where you roll for what soup you order then fair enough but I don't think it's in the vast majority of interest to get bogged down in every single detail mechanic in these games. I, I want to know more about the games that you've been in uh, <laughs> where you've had to roll to see what soup you've ordered. Uh, I don't know, it just sounds like... <laughs> sounds, sounds great. I know. Sounds very immersive. <laughs> I, I rolled a natural 20 and I got tomato. Oh, quid's in. <laughs> <laughs> and it had croutons. <laughs> I have run a game for Andy, where he established on the first session that his character cast detects poison on every piece of food he ever ate. <laughs> so yeah. occasionally I had to catch him out and say, yep, there's poison in there. Yeah, that was amazing. And then it was like my character would be like, someone's tried to poison us. It's like, I, I knew it. It's I just knew this spicy. Was it's just very <laughs> spicy. It was like, yeah, it's a poison, but it's not actually a poison. <laughs> like, it's yeah, human. Like, yeah, it's like chocolate. It's poison. It's actually if you eat enough exactly. of it. Exactly. You're playing a dog. <laughs> Technically a point. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was it was quite good because every time it was like food's been put in there and there'd be this silence and I was like, gosh. And he'd be like, no, it's not poison. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> just easy Jay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you can't you can get bogged down in rules. So if you're playing, do not worry about them. If don't worry about getting them wrong, don't worry about interpreting them differently. If you're not sure, discuss it with your players. But I suppose that comes back to what you said. There, uh, before John, play the game yourself. If you yeah. can, don't you know? I would, I wouldn't recommend running a game unless you've either got a good amount of experience in other systems similar, or you've played that particular system yourself, um, because it's a lot to take. On, unless you're willing to spend a lot of time researching it and delving into it. But what I think, I think the internet's a good place now for that, where you can just go and watch campaigns and you can see how the games get run. Yeah, but you, I wanted to show my age. Back, back in my day, you had to find great, you had to find games. Uh, yeah. But now you can literally just go on YouTube or Twitch or wherever, yeah. type in actual play session, and that's it. Then you've got mm. yourself a your example. Whereas in the old games, you literally had reams and reams of pages and scripts and explanations as to how this worked. And back then, we still got it wrong. We got, I got it wrong for three mm. years. So, um, but now, yeah, it's, there's, there's a, you've got a whole host of resources online now, which is really helpful. Yeah, there's so much. There's there is a lot out there. I mean, I I started gemming back in 1989, I think 88, 89. Um, but you know, it was a, a game that interested me. It was fun. It was, but you know, it was going to the comic shop and picking up the latest book was the the most exciting thing, and and talking about it and reading stuff. But now we have the internet, and it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's. Yeah, I think that that's the biggest perk that you have now that you don't have is that you can go and watch these sort of things online. Because, you know, even back in back in the day, um, I'm too young to really say that. But you know, it probably you know too long ago you couldn't do that sort of thing. You'd have to speak to players to get how stories went, and they would always, you know, it would always be slightly warped and everything. I think the fact that you know, as much as I don't like to 
exposed to too much you know just having games like critical role and all of that online it's a it's great in the aspect of it's great that people know about it more and can play it um but at the same time again don't take it as a bible when you watch somebody everyone kind of does it differently everyone has their own way of doing it so don't worry about it too much mm -hmm. everyone yeah, has a lot of people look this yeah people also look a lot to like simplify the rules mm. like it's like when you play D D fifth edition enough you realize night the game is like roll a d20 and add a number to it yeah that is how d20 systems work <laughs> Yeah, but that's the thing. It's, but that's the thing. Like, just you can get through so much of the game just by doing that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, does anyone else have any advice for a new Q, uh, new DM GM that they'd like to? Uh, very quickly, don't. If there's a rules lawyer at your table, uh, try not to uh, talk to them too much because they Shoot. will literally take over the game as you're trying to run the game and explain what you're doing wrong and that's yeah. not what you want to hear okay so if it's a rules lawyer just agree with them that you're running the game and they can discuss any issues with you after the game and not during because that used to happen to me quite a lot when i first started and uh, it's, it's the most soul crushing destroying thing when you're trying to entertain people and there's someone at the table saying well actually what you should have done is blah 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 because two things are going to happen one you're not going to do it again because you're going to feel a little bit deflated or yeah. you're going to punch that person in the face now i don't condone <laughs> violence but i wanted to punch that person in the face <laughs> that's why josh uses face rig there yep. you go what can i say <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, so yeah, make sure any discussions with rules, any problems with rules, leave it till after the game. Just like you were saying earlier, let the game run, let the game just flow, make decisions. But any issues, wait till the game's over and then talk talk it through. Yeah, I mean, you know, Josh over there, he is our our right. biggest rules lawyer. But <laughs> I'm not a rules lawyer. You are. But you, you're very. You are very. I'm rules and what? You're rules lawyer. I don't but identify. No, no rules, rules lawyer disrupts play. Yeah. yeah. No, rules, yeah, rules like, are really, you know, really, really handy. They can be really, really helpful yeah. in really, in really situations where the where the dice roll will make a lot mm. of difference, and they can be really, really helpful. But you, what you don't want is somebody pixel bitching about what you're doing with the with the rules. That can be yeah. really, really annoying. Don't yeah. let the rules get in the way of fun, because yeah, what no. are you what are you doing this for? You are doing it for your own enjoyment as a GM DM to help your players experience something maybe different. I mean, I'm I'm doing some D&D &D at home with my eight-year-old daughter and teaching her rules and, and, and getting her to actually role play. Just mm. little bits of encouragement. It's, it's the light signs. And if you get that light in a player's eyes from what you're doing, it's, it's, it's all good. Yeah. yeah. That think, is fine. I think, it, you know, having that person, don't, you know, don't dismiss them because I Still genuinely, not. Kadari is one of the best people to have in our games because I do spam him with messages throughout games of like, how does this mechanic work? Can I do this? <laughs> and it's helpful not interrupting the GM who's actually running the game and everything, but having somebody there who you can just ask those questions in the game. So it's yep. not, it's not a bad thing to have somebody whose rules have wow. not heavy rules intelligent and in the game yeah yeah. But yeah yeah as a as as a gm do not be afraid to start setting rules for your players like that you know if you mm. have someone like that say to them you know outright if you've got a problem with any of the rules don't bring it up during the game or just nod at me or give me a sign or something and we'll discuss it after don't interrupt the game but i think uh, i would say a lot of that's more on the player person if you're that player don't don't be yeah. don't be an ass. You're, you're there to play. You're not GMing. You're there to play. Yeah. If if, if you've got a problem, run your own game. Yeah. <laughs> Simple as. Yes, <laughs> he does. He runs. I am running my own. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Any more advice, guys? Right. I think we should, uh, I think we covered quite a lot of ground, to be honest. That's yeah. The first question. I think we've spoken the topic through, which is why I wanted to start with it, because it always ends up being the... If you look up sort of discussions on topics about this, about new GMs, the last thing they always say is, what advice would you give? And then it's always a couple of lines because they've already talked about everything. Yeah. Let's just start with it and get all the important stuff out <laughs> there. <laughs> yeah, and if, if you're happy with that, there you go. You can go off and do something else. I'll go and run the game, go and practice. Um, Thanks for coming. Thank, yeah, cheers. See you later. Bye. Right. So Unfortunately, we've stayed. got more questions. <laughs> so you stayed. We've got more questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> Can I finish my job? Four cats, like, I've literally spent hundreds of points. <laughs> <laughs>
is going to have some attention. <laughs> I've got loads of questions. We have got them all, Borgat. Borgat basically sent me a message last week saying, I need some advice on new GMs. And I was like, there's a Q&A coming up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, one of the things I've got on here is about uh, published campaigns versus writing your own campaign. So when you're starting off as a DM, do you want to write out an entire campaign? Do you have that knowledge, or would you prefer to start with a published campaign? I always recommend people start with published campaigns when they're trying to learn the system, but yeah. what's everybody else's thoughts? I mean, yeah, like, I would do the same, but at the same time, is you kind of need to research what's available, because the problem as well is the person writing the adventure will have their own expectation of the kind of person who runs this. Like, if you mm. look at, like, the early D&D adventures, there's some that are really good for new, DM, 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 uh, new DMs because they kind of, like, they cover all the descriptions, all the rules, they do all, like, explanations and stuff to help you get the grips with it. And then there's other ones where basically, like, here's things that happen in it, off you go. <laughs> um... So yeah, it's kind of, it does help give you a framework and kind of see how people do run adventures. But like, yeah, you need to kind of also make sure it's written for, or designed in a way that would actually be helpful as a DM. Yeah, it's a really hard one for me. I mean, I've never run any RPG with any published adventure or campaign. I go into the game world, I pick the game world. If I, I buy all the modules, I buy the adventures. I may take one little bit out, one piece here, one piece there. But I start simple, build it up slowly, because sometimes you can get overwhelmed when you're looking at this, you know, maybe 200 page campaign book mm. and you need to know law and history. You know, mm. I don't need to know that. I, I need to know that, you know, I'm, I'm in a field or I'm in a, a small village. There's an inn. There's a, a merchant there. There's goblins in the, the hills or orcs or whatever. You're going to go out and kill them and introduce stuff slowly as you go, and every time they come back to town, they learn something more. Every time they do an adventure, they mm. learn something more. Don't get, again, don't get bogged down by having to know a whole campaign book. Mm. Yeah, it's the inside out design thing. That's kind of a recommendation as well. Is it just, I remember, read, I remember you only build what they're going to interact with. Yeah. Like, don't worry about like everything else. I remember reading somewhere that rule books aren't complicated, they're comprehensive. Mm. And so you just need to yes. take them a, a, a slice at a time. Um, and then use what you need for that evening's entertainment. Now, one of the best yeah. rule books I've ever read is the Star Wars uh, role-playing game by West End Games, the first edition by Greg Ostikan. It is just amazing because everybody's on the same page. They know Star Wars. They know what's expected. And then the adventure at the end, um, of which escapes me. I can't remember what it's called. But the adventure, huzzah, that's one of the best source books ever. I've still got all my originals from 1987 because I'm, I'm like that. And um, I've still got the Games Master screen's been held together by Sellotape. Incredible. Well, I won't buy a new one. It's a good week. Uh, have you got all of these? I used to have every single book um, in the collection. I was missing one adventure journal uh, of the entire Star Wars range. Um, but I sold it all except for my main core books because I, I had a son on the way and I needed funds. I've so, got them all down there. All the adventure oh, journals. Give me, your, give me your address later. I won't go <laughs> with anything. I'm probably here. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But the adventure at the end is so well laid out, so well paced for mm. beginning players, and the whole war book itself is so well laid out. I, I, that's, that's, the, that's the game I, I suggest to any new role player because everybody knows Star Wars. They know what's going to happen. They know what to expect. They know what's yeah. being referenced. All you've got to learn is the rules, and the adventure takes, it through, takes you through every aspect of the rules bit by bit. It's absolutely fantastic. I've got every published West End game um, adventure, source book, anything over there, and I have not run one of them fully. I take little bits out all the time. I, I enjoy just reading them. Mm. Yeah, they're really good read, except for um, what was it called? Scavenger Hunt. No, <laughs> I won't do so. it's a bad, It's a bad scenario, and the artwork's terrible, so sorry. Yeah. Scavenger um, Hunt, no. Oh, it makes me shiver just thinking about it. I, I would come in and say that personally for myself is I have a difficulty with the preset stuff um, purely because I, I'm i probably the worst player in a lot of campaigns because I don't easily follow stories. Um, I make notes, but I don't actually understand them. And I think when I started looking at Mutants Mass Mind, which was my first campaign, you know, it's the first one that I've ever done. Um, I just made the decision not to do any of the presets because I was just about getting to grips with the rules 
and I could not follow the stories that they were doing as presets. Maybe that was just specifically for the presets in Mutants and Masterminds, but I made the decision to do my own story because I felt like I could keep control of the story if it was mine. Whereas if I had to follow a script and read that, I I, I genuinely had the difficulty because I I don't know if I, if I some some of the presets I just got bored off reading and I was like right okay yeah and because of that I didn't absorb it I didn't feel like I knew the story properly um, but I'd say that's personally just because I am that sort of person if I don't find a story interesting I don't absorb any of it mm. and I just sit and I will just be like what are we doing I have not got a clue. Uh, but I, I the the, info. yeah, I remember anything that I find interesting parts of the story and everything. But I, I am a terrible person for it. My mind wanders too much. Um, so yeah, personally, I decided not to do any of the presets and just go straight in for my own little hoo ha campaign. I well, would like to do a preset though. Yeah, I like to change them because you can mm. guarantee that one of the tossers at the table has read the adventure. Yes. So I like to change everything. <laughs> I'll actually make notes before. Did I call them tossers? I meant players. <laughs> you got it right first time. You got it right first changeable. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's me done. So, um, so yeah, so I'd change it. I'd make notes beforehand. I don't want to change it on the fly because otherwise I'll just be accused of cheating, as mm. if you can cheat a role playing game. And then if they turn around and say, well, that's not supposed to happen, I can say, one, you read the adventure, you shouldn't have, go away. And two, actually, here's the notes of my changing before we even started playing. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I take, take a lot of people which adventures and I change them and take them in directions that I wanted to go because, you know, it's ex more exciting that way for me as, 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 as the GM. Yeah. I, I, Something I, you'll notice a bit in 5e published adventures uh, in Curse of Strahd, for example, they have some randomised elements. So when you start to prepare the adventure, the GM will roll some dice or draw some cards and from that determine elements of the adventure that change. So if you do have players at the table that have played before, they see some different things. A lot of the encounters, there are a couple of different encounters you can have in a location. Yeah. That's good because it gives the game longevity and you can go back I can yeah. play it again, you know what I mean? Yeah. Sort of make Especially when you've decisions. spent 40 quid yeah. on this adventure book. You don't want to run it once. <laughs> yeah, you would it for two nights and it's like, bloody hell, I could have, I could have bought Mass Effect for that. Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah. I had that for 114 hours. But the, um, yeah, no, that, that, that's, that's, I like that idea in the game. Like I say, it gives it longevity and sort of sparks new ideas as well. You can take the adventure in different directions. Yeah. Yeah. So it would be nice if they would separate the adventure books and the campaign setting books. Yes. Like, oh, I'd like to know this thing about the game. But by doing so, I have to buy the book, the adventure in it. <laughs> buy the adventure, kind of just cut out the first half. Yeah. <laughs> it's basically what we're saying about the DMG before we start. Yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd probably say it also depends on the system and how well it's wrote. I mean, I, yes. I do know there are some good starter campaigns that literally pull you through it and explain things as you go along and baby feed you. And then you can see some where it's like, well, here's a character, here's a class here's the rules for that, but then doesn't explain any of the other rules for the game, so you're still kind of left in, in the darkness about yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's some campaigns out there are better than others for pulling you through, and I think you'd have to ask people what specific campaigns they are. Um, like I said, I can only go off the campaigns that I've read about Mutants and Masterminds. Personally, I tried not to read about any others because I want to play them as a player. So I, it's hard for me to say because I've not read that many. Well, I've not read any that are outside of Mutants and Masterminds because I want to play them all. And if I read them to see what they're like, I will ruin it if <laughs> I am the player. Mm. So I'm, but I will. I have gone back on a few after the game's been done to actually read it, like more out of curiosity than anything to just go, what did we miss? What did we do wrong? How did this all go badly? Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, also yeah. I want to publish adventure. Don't run a campaign. Just run a short, some short adventures first. Don't start a new game and thinking, that's it, boom, I'm going to run Masks of Neon Lathotep. No, no, no. T take it easy, calm down, Fred. Just sit down and run a couple of short adventures, push adventures first, just to get used to that way of doing things. Don't dive yourself into a massive multi-page, 18-month campaign. 
I mean, yeah, if you want to dive into the deep end, you know, don't don't let me stop you. But uh, mm. yeah, if you're new to it, no, just baby steps, just take it bit by bit, just so that you get used to how way that a published campaign or published adventure is is written and how you use that at the table. Because otherwise, mm. you're going to spend half the event, half the session sat there reading the text in front of you, whilst your players are waiting. So you basically, you're just reading the short story to yourself whilst you're wondering where they're going to go next with the adventure. Yeah. So, uh, but but yeah, I'd suggest that. Coming off the back of that, actually, there was a question in chat, which was, uh, if you are running a pre-existing published adventure, how much prep do you do on top of what's already there? How much time do you spend reading through that and adjusting that to your party? I'll just read it, to be honest with you, cover to cover, every single bit, with a notebook. Yeah. And then if there's any key moments where I'm thinking... Uh, that might change. Something might happen there, which might take him off in this direction by mistake, or they might come to the wrong thingy. And I'll make a little note of it. So I'll make page twenty-four. Uh, I know Charles takes huge amounts of psychoanalytic drugs. Will this change the way this works? That's never actually happened in the game. It's not personal experience. So <laughs> put that in there. You know what I mean? And just make notes of areas where which you think you're not hundred percent sure about. Then when you actually win the game, you can refer to your notes, and then you're prepared for it when it comes up in the actual game. But f f for sure read it from cover to cover uh, literally including the credits because those yeah. guys wrote it they deserve recognition so read it from cover to cover every single every every bit that's in there if there's box outs with little notes and stuff in there make notes of where the box outs are because they're there to help not to not to hinder i, th I think you couldn't not do it where you read the full campaign because there could be points where your players may ask a question on to a certain character who could end up being the villain and if you don't mm. know yourself that he's going to be the villain yes. and how he's done <laughs> yeah. something, you could completely destroy the campaign by giving them the wrong information. So I think yeah. you've, you've got to, you at least, to it, yeah. minimum, you have to have read the whole campaign that's set. Mm. Because otherwise, like I said, you can't then incorporate bits that are going to happen later on and set them up sort of thing. Because you have to know it. You, you have to know yeah. the full story. No, especially if you're running... Not so much a short campaign, but a very long campaign like some of the uh, Pies or Adventure Paths that are designed to go from 1 to 17, 18, 19. Mm. That mm. you need to know everything that's going on there. Because things that happen at the start of that when your players are level 1, 2, 3 can affect things much later on. And if you don't have that information as a GM, you aren't really prepared to give the right information to the players. You mm. either have to then rewrite chunks of it or tell the players that you gave them the wrong information, which feels wrong in general. Yeah, it's one of them. You shouldn't be as surprised as the players are when the, the yes. boss reveals himself. <laughs> that's just you should not be the surprise one. That, 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 that doesn't go well at the table. We just go <laughs> bloody hell! Here's the bloody boss. Bloody hell! It's him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that the wouldn't boss. go down well. Yeah, no, you do. Oh, sorry, uh, oh, we, we adventures, sorry, is a very good indicator of when you do your own adventures of what to do, how to structure it. How yes. to make a story flow. Some of the best ones that my uh, yardsticks are, are always Masks of Nyarlathotep and the Empire with uh, the Enemy Within campaign from Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay First Edition. That that's my yardstick as far as great campaign design is concerned because it takes a hell of a lot into consideration. It takes a hell, it, it oozes atmosphere. So yeah. if you're looking to write your own or just create your own uh, adventure for that particular that particular game that you're playing, whether it be Cthulhu, Warhammer, or Dungeons Dragons, yeah, read the published adventures. You know, just give you an idea on how to lay out an adventure. Yeah, Enemy of Him was a fantastic campaign. Absolutely thoroughly enjoyed playing that one and running it. It's just hilarious. I don't, I don't, I don't know why Empire in Flames gets so much stick because I think that's a fantastic <laughs> campaign. I, mean, I had to make a couple of adjustments. I think everybody did, but it was so well done. It was so mm. well. It's wonderful artwork on the front cover as well. But yeah, Enemy Winning campaign was just fantastic. I loved it. Yeah. Live, uh... you got anything you want to put on that? No, I think it's basically the same kind of agreeing with you guys. Um, yeah. yeah. Moving away from yeah. the everything's written down for you, hopefully, yeah. element. Uh, question from chat from Mjolnirva. What kind of advice or tips would you give to be able to adapt and think on the fly when a situation changes? Obviously something we all need to do as a DM, but how do you approach that when something you didn't expect happens, when the players make a choice that you hadn't planned for? Go to the toilet. <laughs> I'm not yes. joking. No, <laughs> okay. yeah, I have used that. What guys, because we sat here for an hour and a half. <laughs> I didn't 
toilet. <laughs> and then you go to the toilet and you sit on the toilet like this for about ten minutes. Going, oh my god! <laughs> And then you just get, and then you just, you just, you just adapt, and then you, then you come back. You literally just take a break. That's, Honestly, that's that, yeah, that, all, all seriousness, that is the the best way to do it. Is if you're yeah. not prepared and you're not sure, just say, Go, all right, um, let's take five. Let me, and he, you can be honest to your players. Let me reassess, um, and we'll we'll come back in five once I've sorted this. Unless you really um, need you... to talk. After you come back yeah. to the corner, yeah. <laughs> and I think eventually, then you'll just be able to be like, well, unless you keep them talking to, to each other for five minutes while well, I figure yeah. this out the background. Be like, oh, look, yeah. there's a goblin at the end of the bar. Yeah, bring in oh, snot the goblin. <laughs> <laughs> Three years oh, later, yeah. Yeah. Three years later, the little shit's still alive. Yeah, but <laughs> I think try not to panic. I think yeah. I think a yeah, lot yeah. of people yeah. can sure. get into those situations and start panicking like crazy, going, oh my god, what do I do? I, I didn't anticipate it. Just, yeah play it out it is, just... it is just a game it's not life or yeah. death take yeah. take a moment and smile at your players as if what they've done is exactly what you planned definitely maybe roll some extra dice yes ask, ask to roll for initiative yeah uh, oh we've nope. lost uh -oh. john nope he's coming on and now we're all in the wrong <laughs> spot. We're the no, we're all in the wrong <laughs> spot. Yay! So sorry. Don't worry about it. That's fine. Unbelievable. Oh, that's that's my fault. I am sorry. That's completely my fault. It's sorry. Fine. Don't worry about it. I missed that then. What did you say in the last 10 seconds? <laughs> uh, more of what you said, pretty yeah. much. Smile, <laughs> roll some dice. Yeah. Yes. To roll yeah. a perception yeah. roll. And then go. Yeah, don't panic. Mm. Give yourself some time. Okay. Budget. <laughs> this is a um, game. Yeah, but. It's one of them. I think every every GM will take it their own way. Some will need a break and just to kind of reassess it if you want to keep it serious. Don't be afraid to just kind of wing it. Honestly, I think yeah. I, I've done this now three occasions in my Mutants campaign where everyone has done something that I didn't plan for and I, I've just w winged it. And I've just gone, right, okay, let's see where this goes. And it has led to some interesting developments. Um, well, like the ice cream van. <laughs> <laughs> exactly like the ice cream van, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's something you've definitely got to be prepared for to happen. I think I said this in your advice is don't, you know, don't plan for everything to go according to plan. Um, yeah. No plan survives yeah. contact with the enemy. So I think it helps, yeah, to kind of keep things sort of loose, like even just as like points or like overarching goals or whatever. Yeah. Because yeah, the thing is, if if you if you do too high on detail to be like, oh, this scene has to play out this way, then yeah, something's going to go wrong. Um, yeah. I think and think this comes yeah. back to as well, don't over plan things because it, you you could waste a lot of time over planning things that, that never get used. I've seen countless times where people have built maps and built sequences that have been completely destroyed because either the players just didn't go down that corridor yep. or they decided they didn't want to do that. I've been in a game with Kadari where he had this amazing boss battle sequence planned and I ended it with a one hell of a natural crit chain that disintegrated the enemy and it, that, was know, impressive, <laughs> that was amazingly <laughs> impressive and it's like it happens don't get bogged down about it if you're if you're stuck just have a break hey, and to be honest and don't worry about just ending the session there and then if you if you think you're yeah. going to need a lot of time just say right okay um and if you can you know, try and skip over it and come back to it. But if you really, you know, if your players really go off on a tangent, there's two ways of doing it. You can have a drop a brick wall on their plan and force them back onto well, then, the story. Yeah. 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 Or you go, <laughs> right, okay. Um, and just, again, be honest with you, right, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, I'll leave the session here, guys, and we'll come back next week um, and we'll go down that road. Mm. You know, you, so that, was, that was that was what was great about early Dungeons and Dragons design was the fact that you were going into dungeons and you had these mm. dungeon maps laid out. So the actual area and what you were doing and where you were going was very very focused. So in your first few games, keep it focused in a single area. Don't give them an entire world to explore. You just let yourself open for trouble yeah. if you're not ready for it. But give them a, a simple little dungeon excursion or a space station excursion or or um, you know like a warehouse excursion. It's, you've got an enclosed area where you can control the action and they can go in certain directions. Yes, you might.
might be limiting their choices at first, but that's more to help you than it is to them. And nobody's used to those kind of games anyway. And that's what they, that's what a lot of people expect. So yeah, those little dungeon locations, in the early D and D games especially, they were really handy to keep the games focused. Yeah, and there's there's way if 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 you do decide to drop a brick wall on it, don't try and avoid just going. No, you can't do that. Um, oh yeah. If you can give them a bit of story and throw them back in. So, for example, if your character's like, oh, we want to go to this town and it's completely relevant and it was pointless, you just say, you spend a day, you go to this town, you find nothing of worth, but you do find a clue that leads you back to the town that you, you were in. And so you head back. And, you know, don't just kill them, but give them something to basically go, you shouldn't, you don't need to go that way, but keep it in the story rhythm. Um, I think it can really ruin a moment if you just turn around and say, no, you're not going to that no. town. One of the worst <laughs> things you can do, either as a new or even as an experienced uh, DGM, is to, when a player says, I want to do this, this, and this, is just to go, no, you can't. Because yeah. it might might ruin your plans or it might, it might take them in a direction that you don't want them to go. Just saying a plain no is... It's, it's just not. It's, it's just rude. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean. They're there to be as creative as you are, as, in the best of their ability in their um, position as a player, um, and you just telling them no to something they might have worked out in their head for ten minutes, thinking this could be really, really cool, or why haven't we tried this yet? Then just be told no to your face. Yeah. Like God. And no, it's uh, it's it's not good. It's not good at the table at all. I, improv is. Here I come. Yeah. Improv is definitely something you develop as you spend more time as a DM. Sure. But never yeah. directly say no to a player. Never reach that point where it's just dead end. If you need yeah. time to think about it, take the time to think about it. Like John says, go to the bathroom. Or just tell players you need to think about it for five minutes. If you have no idea how you want them to proceed, it's okay to say to the player, I'm not sure where we're going with this. What do you want to happen here? Yeah. If the player isn't giving you enough information, but they have something very specific in their head, clarify mm. that with them rather than yeah. trying to guess what they want to do. Yeah. Yeah. If a player um, starts a conversation with, I want to fireball the floor, they're not just trying to make it a bit scorched, they have a plan, figure out what their plan is, ask them what yeah. their plan is after I, fireballing the floor. Yeah, where do you want to go with this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you, oh, you've, no. you, you've got to allow your players a bit of freedom. <laughs> give Andy an idea. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you you can't say anything after my puppeteering magic that I pulled off on your campaign. Only worked because you got a crack. <laughs> yeah, but even <laughs> you didn't know what I was doing until that happened. That is true. <laughs> well, yeah, your players will. You know, you've got to remember if you've got players who've played a lot, they have creative minds. New players may have creative minds, but they tend to keep it to themselves, so do anticipate that. But if you've got people who have played multiple campaigns, you'll find that they're very easy to creatively decide something and give you something. Um, but yeah, re if you can at all costs, do not just dismiss it completely and go, no, take a five, take a break, re you know, go away, or trying to think of a way to creatively let them do it, but then basically say no. So if they, you know, like again, if they say, oh, I'm going to go to this town, you go, okay, well, you pack up your gear, and as you're about to leave the front door of the town, the guard comes up to you and says, you you know, someone in the town needs to have a word with you, and throw them back in, you know, mm -hmm. and just give them another reason not to want to go to that town to go to where you want them to actually go, and try and feed it into them, even let them start on a hike and everything, and then something happens along the way that forces them to go back. It's There's ways of doing it, and just saying no should never really be on the table. Because it's a form of railroading, really, because you're trying to force the players it's to go in a certain direction. heavy yes. railroading and that, and that, is, that. That, is, that is literally tying them to the carriage, and mm. then you know, just giving a one-way ticket to Northampton, because it's literally... You're, you're telling them what they can and can't do in the game, yeah. in, the, in the aspects yeah. of the game, and nobody wants to be told what, what to do. No. You don't. You, nobody wants their player stopped dead-end just like that. It's uh, it's not fair on the player, really. Yeah. yeah. We've discussed this in a past Q&A, but there is an element of... There is such thing as too much railroading. Some yeah. railroading is pretty much given. Uh, for example, what John was saying earlier about staying in a dungeon. If you give the players a dungeon, you don't expect the players to say, we want to leave the dungeon and go somewhere else. Mm. Yeah. If you establish that the players are exploring a dungeon, you don't want them to go away. Yeah. And, you know, if they want to go away, you're gonna, you might have to just stop at that point and say, 
do you want to be in its dungeon or not? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what, there is what, a point you where you are yeah, railroading, yeah, yeah. and we accept it because yeah. we've all agreed that we want to go into this dungeon. Yeah. But if a player has something creative, don't just shut them down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a good point because you know, you, there is a, again essence on the players to kind of keep themselves in check on this is you don't want yeah. to start a campaign and go right you're all in a dungeon and the first thing that one of the players says is right well i'm going to leave the dungeon well at that point you say hang on stop the game are you why are you playing this campaign yeah why are you here yeah why are you this here? is something That's that you should establish attitude. thematically yeah. before you start but this, this is why a lot of games are, are really good with session zero session zero yes. you need yeah. to establish why you're there what you're doing there what's going to happen in the campaign and uh, yeah, you set up. The, the, you manage people's expectations at that point. Both GMs a and chunk players. Of yeah. Questions about session zero. Session being zero. A separate section. Could be a whole new Q and A. It is a. It is already a whole yeah. Q and A. I have so many questions yeah. for it. But feel free to let your players give you that Flash. information. You tell them you're here. Tell me why. Why are you here? And you force yeah. that yeah. bit. That's minor railroading where you tell them that they're doing something, but you let them explain to you, to the party and everyone, why they're no, doing yeah. that particular Railroading thing. shouldn't be a bad word. Railroading, to some yeah. degree, is a given. Yeah. We are all here to go through this dungeon, and we're all agreed on that. I'm still railroading you. I'm still saying don't leave the dungeon, but we're all agreed that we want to enter the dungeon, not yeah. leave the dungeon. <laughs> yeah. And again it, again, it comes down to the players is you shouldn't want to be in a campaign where you decide, well, I know that I, and you, you sat there going, well, I've got all this evidence from the GM that indicates I should go here. I'm going to go here instead. Don't do that. Unless no. you have a legit reason for your character and you can explain that, don't be the asshole who does that. You know, and so as a GM, you shouldn't come across it too often unless you give them misinformation and you've caused them to not realize yeah. in which point take it but then redirect them back to where they should be and confirm with them that they were on the wrong trail um yeah. because i i wouldn't like to say that you should come across people who blatantly just want to go against the story if that's happening that, you really need to just pull them aside happen, yeah, it does yeah. happen i mean sadly you, you you've always got this fine balance between gms who are going to railroad the uh the campaign and then you've got some players who will derail the campaign yes. yeah. and there's it's really yeah. this fine balance uh, some those players um I, I, I mean you you can't talk generally about you don't know why they're doing that um and a lot of the time i eject from the, from the from the game if they're there just to disrupt and be annoying if they're there to socialize that's fine well i'll meet you down the pub later but yeah. if and if they turn up and then start to disrupt the game and ruin other people's fun i know it's just a game at the end yeah. of the day but you're not there to to ruin other people's night and if you're there purposely to do that my question is why am i friends with you in the first place yeah so because uh, I, I don't know people like that I've come across plenty of people like that, and they get some sort of kick out of it. Yeah. Um, so you just eject it from the game. Um, but that's, that's you, a, again, you, that's, that's another discussion for yeah. another time. I think. But you, you should never be the only player in a game, anyway. So you know, yeah. you've got to remember there are other players, and yeah. what you want out of the campaign might not be what they want, and you, you have to compromise. You have to go with the party. If yeah. not, you shouldn't be in compromise. that campaign. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. It's a, um, it's a social. It's a social hobby. Why would you want to be unsocial in that hobby? That's, yes. uh, that's the way I see. Why would you bring a rugby ball to a football match? You know what I mean. So, yeah. so you know, yeah. don't, it shouldn't happen too often. And if it does happen, it should. It shouldn't be major incidents. It should, like I said, no. you shouldn't have players wanting to go completely against the story. They may be. They may have misinterpreted bits of story. At which point, try and redirect them back on track if you can. Um, but. Like I said, if worst comes to worst, take a break. But try, you know, the one thing you must try not to do is just turn around and say no. Mm. That that can yeah. cripple a campaign. It can even cripple a person, you know, if they have this idea. And if they were genuinely thought that that was the right thing to do and like, oh, I'll go here. And you turn around and say, no, you can't do that. You can kill them inside mm. because then they will be like, oh, Oh, I really, I yeah. And, the, yeah. and then they yeah. will feel bad that they've come to the worst conclusion, that they've ruined it. And you, you don't want that because then they'll be less inclined to get involved. And, you you know, you want people to get into these games and that. And turning around to someone and saying, no, you can really put them back into a shell if you're not careful. Mm. This is something to be very aware of in relevance to new DMs as well, because a lot of the time, if you're a new DM, you have new players at your table. 
you know, you've got a group of friends together, none of you have played before, you all want to try something. Mm. It's very important to not shut down your players in that situation because if that's their first experience with an RPG and they didn't enjoy it because of the way the DM acted, they're less likely to then try and find another RPG group. They're just going to give up on it. Mm. Yeah. 100%. So, yeah, it, it will happen. There's not much you can really plan in advance for it, but just do whatever you need to do to deal with that. If you can think you can do it on the spot, go ahead, try it. If you need a break, take a break. Don't feel pressure that you have to come up with an answer there and then. There was a, uh, another question from Borgat in the chat that I think we mostly just covered. Uh, if players start going off topic or derailing the game to some degree, how do you minimise that and pull them back on track? I think we mostly covered that, but does anyone have any other thoughts on that? I would say if someone's <laughs> definitely doing it and constantly doing it, pull them aside. Mm. Have a break and just say, can I have a word with you? Or, you know, wait till the end of the game. You have to mention it to them. If, if you genuinely feel that they're doing it on purpose, do not be afraid to just say to them, look, I feel like you're doing this. Are you doing it intentional? And if you are, you have to stop. Yep. Don't put up with it. Because if you put up with it, it, it will... the thing is, you got to remember as a, as a GM, you're running the game for multiple people. And as much as... Yeah. You know, you can't make it fun for one person because the chances are it will ruin it for <clears> everybody. <throat> so if there is somebody yeah. like that who's purposely derolling, it's ruining it for you and it will be ruining it for the other players. They may not say it if they're kind enough to just let it go on. Um, but you, you, yeah, it, it's your responsibility. You're running that game. You have that responsibility. You're the referee. You have to yellow and red card people if they break the rules of your game not just you know not the rules of the actual whatever you're playing the rules of your game you have to set those rules how far will you let people push them before you have to turn and you do some you eventually you if you play with open people or even a bunch of friends there will come a situation where you may just need to say to somebody that's not quite what i want in this campaign i remember yeah. as well as the gm you're there to have fun too Yes. Not there to supply oh, fun to the people. You're supposed to be having fun together. And if it's ruining your fun as well, don't feel guilty to turn around and say, Do you know what? This is actually ruining it for me. I'm not really enjoying this. And just be honest. So you're there to enjoy yourself too. The moment you're not enjoying it, just take a step back, figure, figure out why it is you're not enjoying it. And if that's the reason, then yeah, exactly. Take them aside. You have a chat and you take a break. Don't take him to the toilet with you, just because that, cause that's all sorts of conversations <laughs> which you don't want to get involved with. Of and I will contest that county court judgment. But yeah, just, <laughs> just literally just, they're taken to one side. You're supposed to talk about that on stream. Oh, that's a good point, actually. I do apologise. Yeah, Everybody ignore that. Nobody's no Redacted. Redacted. We'll read that out from the yeah, yeah. Right. To be fair, I never signed an NDA. And, uh, Why will we like, having words? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, yeah, take them aside. Have a chat with them. Explain why. Because they might have a reason why they do it. They might just be bored. They might not want to be there. They've just come along because it's a social thing to do. Yeah. Or they might have misinterpreted it. Or they might just be a bit of a dick. So, yeah, you just, you just, you just find yeah. out. You have to chat. You find yeah. out. If, if they're new players, there's a good chance that they may not even realise that they're doing it. Yeah. They may just be thinking, I, I want to explore this, and you just, you know, you'd be wary of that. If it's a seasoned person who's done multiple games, you shouldn't really have that encounter. Usually mm. people who do it because they want to be a dick get weeded out because yeah. they won't yeah, get yeah. into a lot of games. Yeah. And they usually get but bored. Some, of this, some yeah. of this as well can be a thematic thing, and this is a bit going into... Uh, a future Q&A about Session Zeros, but everybody wants something from RPGs, and as a DM, you are kind of responsible for making a theme that everybody at the table enjoys. Some players enjoy combat play and rolling dice more than they enjoy talking to other players for lengthy periods of time between encounters, as it were. Mm. And... Uh, you have to balance that as a DM, but at the same time, if someone is derailing, typically, it's not just because they're bored of what's happening right now, it's because they don't want to be at the game. Yeah. There's a point where you have to recognise that, you know, maybe you have one player who does prefer the combat and doesn't like the roleplay, and they're quieter in the roleplay sections, but they're, they're being quiet, they're not derailing, they're just quiet. Yeah. 
if they're actively derailing, it's not a thematic thing. It's not that they're bored of this bit of theme. It's that they don't want to be in the game, essentially. Mm. Yeah. There's a point where you can where you can say, this player just doesn't like this. How can I engage this player more in this element of the game? Mm. And there's a point where you have to say, this player needs to be removed from the table for everybody to continue having fun. Yeah. Because um, if they're not having fun, you actually, and you do remove them from the game, you're actually doing them a favour as well. Yeah. They might just feel guilty about, oh, I've got to turn up because, you know, it's a social thing to do, and we're all mates, or what have you, or, or I agreed to come. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're doing everybody a favour. I, I think that one of the best ways you can avoid that sort of escalation is, as a GM, speak to your your players yeah. outside Always of the game. ask your players for feedback. Ask Always them, comes ask, down to a simple yeah. conversation. Yeah. What do you, and ask them what do you want out of this campaign? What what yeah. what 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 is your goal of your character? What would he be interested in? And hopefully they'll they'll give you something that you can work into the story. Even if it's a preset story, you can usually just fiddle around with it to give them exactly what they're sort of after. Um, usually it's good good conversation to have at the beginning of the campaign before you start and just say to your character, you know, when when you learn who what characters they're rolling, say to them. And what is it your character's aiming to get out of this? You know, if it's a character that wants to travel the world, if you get stuck in a town, you know, you have to agree. There's a point where their character will be like, well, I've been in this town for four years now. I wanted to explore the world. <laughs> you know, it's... Yeah, but you've got to communicate yeah. with your players. That, it's the only way you can avoid those sort of search situations from escalating. But hopefully... When it does happen in game, it should just be a one-off. It should be a minor mistake and everything. And you, there are easy ways to just quickly correct that. Or don't mm. worry for it. But you can't plan for it. You, it will happen. Just go with it. Or like I said, take a break. I think that's the the only thing you can do. And I think something relevant to what Andy's saying as well, especially as a new DM, always ask your players for feedback mm. and. Be aware that some people don't like giving feedback publicly. So ask your players for feedback after a session, by all means, but also talk to each of your players individually. Make, Make sure they're still quiz. enjoying it. Make them do a quiz. <laughs> Make sure they're still enjoying it. Make sure that they have the opportunity to give you feedback, yeah. even if they don't want to say it in a group session. Make sure they have the opportunity individually to speak to you and give you that feedback. Yeah. And again, I, I keep coming back to this. It, really comes on the players to do this is that if if you're a player and you're hesitant if you've got a new gm don't don't not tell them because you're worried you might put them yeah. off as a new gm they you, they should be expecting feedback so if there's something that you think they're doing wrong or there's something that you're not enjoying about the campaign approach them outside of the game and have that conversation with them. Don't wait for them to contact you if you genuinely have an issue or something. Do, do re try and reach out to them if you, especially if you've got an idea. Because sometimes if you've got an idea, the a GM c can work that into a story if there's something particular you'd like to do story-wise. There are a lot of problems you can solve just by talking to people. So, if you're having a problem at the table, talk to your GM or talk to the player. Talk to people in general. Yep. Give mm. feedback. If you're not enjoying something, give feedback about it. If you are enjoying something, also give feedback about it. Because we get enough negative feedback and we want to know that you're enjoying things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Has anyone else got um, something they want to say on that question? Yep. Yeah, I think nope. we kind of covered a lot of basically the um, how to deal with problem players aspect of it, I think. Yes. But it's on the other side, for like the more general cases, where it's just a case of, yeah, like, bread, giving them some breadcrumbs to get them back on track. Or even just, even if it's a bit of a swing, you can always just repurpose stuff that you had planned mm. and just rejig it to fit a new location yeah. or a new yeah, branch. It always works for me, yeah. Uh... No, there's a very, uh, it's a very important concept. Consider all of your prep as a situation rather than a scene. So rather than this being the room two doors down from the inn where you meet Jeff. It's just a room where you meet Jeff. If the mm, players go yeah. off track, they still meet Jeff in a room. It's just not that room two doors down from the inn. Who's Jeff? I haven't decided yet. Okay. He's, he's, back to... he's, he's, he's a goblin. <laughs> but Jeff will be hanging around for three years. <laughs> and, uh, yes. Shit. 
I would say kind of. I've done enough prep today. I'm not thinking up who Jeff is. <laughs> I'd say kind of think of it as the mechanic in Left 4 Dead. If you've ever played it, uh, if one of your party members dies during the level, they will randomly appear in like a cupboard later mm. on. But if you walk past that cupboard and don't open it, that you don't lose the ability to bring them back. There'll be another cupboard further on that that they they appear back in. Yeah. So you know, if if they skip something like that. Don't panic and force them to quickly go back. Just yeah, hold off and wait until you can bring them back in again. Yeah, players will always skip information. You can lay yeah. a full trail of breadcrumbs and they'll still go off it. <laughs> players are stupid. <laughs> be flexible with everything, essentially, but especially be flexible with concepts like of things cat. like rooms and information. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's one of that. I think as pl we've all been players, and I said, you, you hear something, you take the wrong clue, and you go down the wrong route yourself. And there's been moments where even I've turned around and gone, all right, so what I thought, nothing to do with that. Yeah, completely right. misunderstood that. <laughs> completely misread that situation. <laughs> it's, it happens. Uh, I think we should have enough time to do one more question. Yep. And conveniently, we've got one more from chat, which Ooh. is... A bit system specific, but kind of fits most systems. Uh, when you're rolling a dice, as a DM, how do you decide what constitutes a pass or a fail? Obviously, in some systems, you have a defined difficulty number. But if you don't, if you need to make it up on the fly, you're asking a player to roll a performance check. How do you decide what passes that? I would probably pick it up based on what they're trying to achieve and how. Because, um, uh, like, the only thing they tend to do is a lot of games tend to do, like, steps of difficulty. So it's like, oh, yes. if you're like, oh, they're doing, like, oh, I'm trying to impress the king by basically being, like, an ass. You're like, oh, in that case, it would be a hard check, which would probably be, like, this kind of range. Um, but then again, you don't have to, like, say what your difficulty is. If you're just like, oh, like for pacing or drama, whatever, um, you can sort of be like, so like, ah, oh, this may be a a pass or a fail because it's sort of middle of the road roll or whatever. You can go one like you can sort of fudge it a little bit, sort of. Yeah, don't don't let the difficulty or the difficulty yeah. number interrupt the flow of what you want to achieve. There yeah. will always be a number you, as a DM or a GM, will have in of, of roughly what they need to roll. And if they roll a one, yes, you can have a laugh. And if they roll a two, yes, you have the, yeah. the Will Wheaton effect. But if they if they roll one under it and you're thinking, well, I really need them to have this. They're a bit stuck. They're not following the breadcrumbs I've laid down. Is it my fault? Is it their fault? Maybe, but let them have it uh, yeah. and, 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 and adapt it to the story. Don't let them miss something totally if it's going to derail the whole, whole adventure, the whole evening and mess something up. Well, I, 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 or something. Yeah, <laughs> but I'd say be careful not to give it to them, because I think yeah, I think there's been situations where you can, they can really bugger up the roles so much that as a GM you're kind of like, I, I at this point I've I've got to give it them, otherwise they're gonna miss it. If if they feel like you're basically gone soft on them and you go, well, I, as you leave you stumble across the clue. It's like, come on. No, because yeah. I think as a player, that's worse. Because there's a moment where if you have a series of fails, when you finally get a win, it's great. That that moment where yeah. you have a win after a long streak of fails is, is an amazing moment. It empowers you and you're like, yes, finally got it. So I think, and if that moment comes from the GM pitying you, and literally going, oh, I've rolled a two. You've done it. You'd be like, no, come on. <laughs> like, <laughs> I rolled a two. <laughs> like, yeah. that shouldn't work. I mean, that's the thing. I like you said rather where prevent because like the one thing you want to do is you want if you you want to tell a story, like the easiest way to stop the numbers stopping the story is you basically like if there's something mission critical that's going to be here for them to discover, they find it and anything if. How good they roll tells them like more context or more information, like because you do have that problem. Yeah, you know, it's just like if if they don't find this thing in this room, yeah, then they might yeah. as well just go home. If you're picking up the dice, there's got to be a 
pass state and a fail state, essentially. They've mm. got to be able to fail this. If it's mission critical, they shouldn't be able to fail that. Yeah. So it should be, like yeah. Wide says, if there is mission critical information, they get that regardless of what they roll. But rolling high might give them a bonus, might yeah. give them some more information yeah. that they wouldn't otherwise get. Yeah. I, th I think a tip I would suggest is don't make them roll. I think in, you know, I, I've done it in, in my campaign where if there's been a bit of information that I really want them to get, I won't make them roll. I'll make them have that dialogue and role play the actual conversation out and then essentially give them the information as they role play the conversation. Don't make them go or roll a, an intim, you know, an intimidating roll or a, a bluff roll. Let them do it and let them role play it out and then f essentially give it to them. But they f they've had to work for it, so they feel like it's got it. If you make somebody roll, you've got to commit to what that roll comes out as. Mm. And in most games, they have mechanics where you work out how it is, you know, whether you have a standard 15 or a 10 or a 5, depending on how difficult the situation is. But if you make somebody roll, you have to commit. If they roll a natural 1 or they roll a natural 20, regardless of how you wanted it, you've got to go with it. You can't just dismiss that roll entirely because then what was the point? If it's mission critical, I would suggest don't make them roll. Make mm. them work for it in a role playing sense. Because I think that's one thing that a lot of people lose if they get too heavy on the dice roll, and is you lose that natural, the role playing element of things where people actually want to have the conversation and get in character because it's all based on a role. And, you know, if a certain character is a big, you know, if he's a big barbarian and everything, and he's rolling an intimidation on a farmyard boy, really? <laughs> just like you have to go you have to look at the situation and go you wouldn't need to roll he's got to be intimidating regardless and so he gets the information if you can't get across the field <laughs> yeah if you can't get across the field don't worry okay. yeah, I, yeah if I had the kids actually clueless and it's just sort of sit that like I'm in danger yeah <laughs> yeah my, my advice would be if it's mission critical don't let it go to a roll unless mm. you are prepared to honour that roll or if it's uh, an item or a bit of information, then and it doesn't work out at that location, Give it just shift it to a different location. So yeah. if they can, didn't find that secret compartment behind the painting, stick it in the next room, or yeah. stick it in the next thing. Or if that NPC did, they didn't get the information out of that NPC, transfer the information to the next NPC, and then they can surrender that information after a fight or or what have you. Just just move to the location of the yeah. of the mission critical thing, if if possible. I mean, they might get to an area where the mission critical thing is definitely behind that door and they've got to get through that door no matter what and then everything goes pear-shaped. It could be an adventure in itself trying to get back into the room, but yeah, yeah just change the location. But change the person. Avoid giving it to them on a silver platter out of pity because they won't so, enjoy that. They won't. Because uh, where's the threat then? Where's the adventure? You're, just, yeah. you're, you're basically just telling them the story then. Yeah. So you know, they might as well just sit there and listen to the story that you've got to weave. No, you, they, they need to feel as though they've earned it. Yeah. And if you give it to them, they'll just think, well, what was all the point of all that half an hour of rolling and searching a room yeah. if you were going to give it to us? You've, you've yeah. got to make them feel like they've earned it because that's that's the fun of this game. You know, these games is you have to feel like you've done something. Like I said, otherwise it is, you're just telling them a story and they're listening, yeah. at which point it's not what this is about. It's not what they're and there for. People remember the failures more than they do the successes. You know, it has to be a really hell of a success for people to remember it for a long time. More often yeah. than not, they remember all those times it went terribly wrong. And because they're the funniest points, that's where <laughs> you can literally look back at it and go, wow, we really got that up. Yeah. yeah. And the dice will always go against you. You know, you do expect failure after failure after failure after failure and vice versa. Sometimes crits can ruin what you planned. And you, you know, your players can KO a really high level boss instantaneously, and then bugger, <laughs> you've got to go with the roll of the dice. Yeah. Um, Anyone else got anything on that? Do you have time no? for last question? Or... Silence. Uh, I think that's it. Actually, that's all the questions I had written down. All the questions from chat. So, <laughs> conveniently um... well timed. We're pretty much done, unless. Anybody in chat who has any last-minute questions? Finish us off. 
Final thoughts from anybody here for new DMs, James? Enjoy. Well, we started fun. with the advice thing, remember? I know. That was, <laughs> that was intentional. You should do like a bullet pointed closing statement. Just like yeah. keep it simple. <laughs> we, we should all have closing statements. Yeah. Get a Don't dice it, Joe. Yeah. Don't, don't, closing don't. statement please take over all my games. I don't want to DM anymore. Send hell. <laughs> Enjoy it. Just... I spend too much time on it. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. We, we try and get you in campaigns. Oh, chat wants snot back. Chat wants to save snot. There you go. You've got oh, new fans. John, you're going to have to do a campaign for us now. I've even got snot. a picture of him. I've still got my old Warhammer <laughs> fault from 1988. And there's even a map of the location where he was taken and a picture of snot. And uh, uh, he was after, cause after they rescued him, three games later, he actually betrayed them. So You're going to have to drop it in Discord. We need a picture of snot. Yeah. 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 I will dig out this picture of snot. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought I'd say that on stream. I'm gonna get a picture of snot from here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I'm just gonna go to the bathroom. Yeah, yeah. it's just ridiculous. Uh, and if you would like if you'd like to see that picture of uh, John Snot, snot. join our Discord. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good job yeah. we call him an ass. <laughs> you know, other normal goblin names. Yeah. Yeah, and if you do have any other questions or you want to speak to some other GMs and DMs, because I think that's the best way to speak to other people who run those games as well, um, yes. join our Discord because we have a plethora of GMs and DMs who have played all sorts of games here. Um, and if, you, if, you, if you're not sure and you're starting up your campaign, ask us the questions. Um, yep. We will help um, because... The, these games only survive because of the people like you if you're watching this thinking you want to be a gm these games are only here because there are people willing to take that mantelpiece there's a, you know you there's a lot of respect for people who do it it's not for everybody it's not easy don't think it's going to be a walk in the park um but yeah it's very rewarding it can be very 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 yeah. rewarding after a so, decent session yeah and you should enjoy it just as much as the players. I think one of the things I enjoy the most about being a GM is I get to be all the characters. Um, I'm a very indecisive person when it comes to picking classes and everything. So when I, as the GM, I get to play them all and I get to chop and change characters so much. So I, I, I enjoy it from that aspect. Um, so yeah, make, make sure there's something in it that you enjoy because it, You've got to enjoy it yourself. If you're not enjoying it, you shouldn't be doing it. Mm. But yeah. But thank you if you are thinking and considering being a GM and DM. Um, thank you. And all the titles are available. <laughs> other than fact, it's usually DM or GM, one or the other. Um, but yeah. No, because it, people want to be fancy and then you get Keeper of Arcane Law. Yeah, God, we're not going down that road. Um, yeah. It, it, <laughs> and do invite us. Honestly, we'd love to play your games. If you yes. if you want a bunch of people to come and test out your game. We will play your game. We will give you feedback. We will not derail it. And you might derail it a bit. Yeah. I haven't derailed anybody's game. I know, I know. I saw my Meow Never and like, Ange complaining about Viscara. That wasn't a derailing. That was just me trolling you. I mean, that's. I mean, it's hard to say like, oh, it's just that when that's all the time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. yeah um, at least you won't be called a game mother. No. Um, <laughs> thank you very much uh, for you guys at home watching. Um, thank you very much to the amazing John Hicks. Um, go check him out. Uh, he's the all. If you didn't know. He's, an, he's the author of Those Dark Places, which we've played here on IMT. If you've not watched it, go check them out. They're some, ama some of the best and more enjoyable games that we've run, I have to admit. Um, Russians in Space with Space Drills and um, Death. Death. Happy, happy, a lot happy of Death. Fun. I died you know in both campaigns. I don't know what all, happened there. All my accents end up Russian. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Russian <laughs> accent, comrade. What are you doing? Yeah. Um, no, too Russian. Too Russian. <laughs> No, no. When, you, when you're not here, John, where can we find you? Um, at John Mark Hicks on Twitter. That's where I used to hang out. That's where I hang out most of the time. My uh, user handle is somebody wake up Hicks because uh, that is actually my name. So thank you, aliens, for giving me street cred in the 1980s. <laughs> Your name is someone wake up Hicks. We've been yeah. lied to this whole time. <laughs> yep. uh, thank you to Kadari over there who 
somehow was told by Ange that he runs these Q and A's now and is doing a fabulous job and keeps yep. them on track and keeps us with questions. Thank you very much, uh, Lloyd. Thank you for joining us tonight. It's always a pleasure. Um, Strain, thank you also for joining us tonight. It's uh, been always a pleasure, sir. Um, it's always nice to just see your book collection more than anything. We enjoy uh, looking at your bookcase. <laughs> very fun, so. Yeah, that was a good stuff. Yeah. Don't be afraid to show off your books if you've got them, guys. Oh, well, I'm yeah, sick of that. You need to stop. You yeah. need to stop. Okay, <laughs> no. now, I'm sorry. See, I'm the, thing, the thing now, yeah, the thing now is every time we, we just nag him to run one of the games on his shelf. Yeah. It took him long enough to get a bookcase set up. Now we just have to suffer with him pointing out every book yeah. he owns whenever we bring them up in conversation. Oh, no. <laughs> you need to do it like the politicians where you turn one face on each time yeah. that you want to show off in the background so we can see it in full. Oh, I'll remember that, yeah. yeah. Go back to the <laughs> Christmas quiz we did where Andy asked us questions about obscure and old TTRPGs and see how many of them are on your show. <laughs> Not that yeah. many. There's oh, literally... Yeah. There's some Vampire the Masquerade, Vampire Requiem, Star Wars, uh, ED role playing game, and there's a couple of D&D and Dragon Hunt stuff. Yep. And that's what we intend to do here on IMT. We're not just your normal D&D streamers. We intend to find the weird and mysterious um, TTRPGs and play them for you guys and for ourselves. That's not more, how we found more so. And yeah, I was in a strange car. So we just had a spare seat. I just appeared. <laughs> I came with this channel. It was there. Shows uh, up. <laughs> Don't want to. Much. It just shows up anyway. <laughs> I do. Uh, thank you very much, guys, for coming along. And we will be back with another Q and A um, as soon as the calendar allows, and as soon as we got more more questions for you to answer. Uh, oh, we'll we've got plenty of questions. We'll be back this Friday with Carbon, I believe. Strain. Yes, yep. Carbon twenty one eighty five. Yes. Um, so be back here 9 p.m. GMT, not GMT, BST, um, BST, here on Infinite Monkey Tales. We'll be back then. And as usual, guys, do not go anywhere once we've gone. We will be raiding Dork Tales tonight um, because they're usually not on when we're finishing. And they, they're they a good bunch, guys. Go check them out. Spam our Frank emote. And we'll see you again next time. Thank, Thank you, you very much, guys. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Take it easy, everybody.